And, uh, thank you all for coming. My name is Andras Shimonia. I'm the managing director here at the Center of Transatlantic uh, Relations. Um, I'd like to uh, to introduce uh, Gunnar Vigan, and then <clears throat> after the introduction, he will he will uh, talk about what he does <laughs> and the tools he has at his disposal at uh, at the European Union uh, for the uh, Eastern Partnership. And then I'm going to ask my uh, my good colleague, our senior fellow, uh, Michael Holtzel, to take over, and we'll have a question and answer session. Um, Gunnar Vigan is, is the European External Action Service Director for Russia, Eastern Partnership, Central Asia, Regional Co Cooperation, and OSCE countries. He's also the Chief Negotiator of the Associ uh, Association Agreement with Georgia, uh, I'd like to mention that we have the ambassador of Georgia here. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, but also with Moldova and Armenia. Mr. Vigan is also the EU's representative in the 5 plus 2 settlement process on, a, on the Transnistria conflict. Gunnar Vigan uh, was born in 1957 in Hamburg. Uh, between 80 and 82, he studied at the University of Hamburg Faculty of Law. In between 83 and 85, he studied at the, you wouldn't guess it, Paul Nitze School of Advanced International Studies, better known as SICE, better, better known as the place where you're sitting now. Um, receiving a master's degree in international relations. And uh, between 91 and 93, Mr. Vegan was pro project manager and financial services team leader, considering technical assistance to the newly independent states uh, with the TASIS program. Uh, between 94 and 97, he worked as assistant to the Director General of the European Commission, Director General of External Economic Relations. Between 99 and 2002, he was spokesman for the External Relations uh, EU Commissioner Chris Patton. 2002-2006, he was head of unit for relations with the United States and Canada. 2006 and 2008, he was head of unit for relations with Russia and uh, and uh, acting director for Eastern Europe, Southern Caucasus, and Central Asia at the DG of External Economic Relations. Now, uh, we're so happy to uh, to uh, uh, to have you here. Um, we. Um, we think this is, uh, this is a timely visit. A lot of questions uh, concerning the, the region that you cover. Uh, I will have my own question. Uh, and I, I, I'm really looking forward to a good discussion. I must tell you that uh, perhaps they haven't told you, your colleagues from the, from the mission, but to have so many people come at this late hour uh, to uh, an event uh, says a lot about the interest. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to invite you to uh, give your lecture. Thank you. Can I stay here or do you want me to go there? I can stay here. Okay, good. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, the fact that you're all here shows that the U.S. is restarting to get interested in the eastern part of the European continent, or as some people would say, Eurasian uh, continent, which is a good sign. And uh, my talks in Washington yesterday and today uh, have shown me indeed that the uh, administration is um, very uh, worried about what's happening and is uh, very much supportive of um, the policy of the EU is pursuing, and indeed we have excellent cooperation with the United States. Um, I would like to uh, first, however, pay tribute to the very fact that I'm sitting here as an alumnus of this school, and even my former professor and boss when I was his assistant at SAIS sits here among you. 
Dr. Wade, head of the Latin American Studies Program. Welcome. Uh, I'm delighted to address you today. I'm afraid it's already almost 30 years ago that I graduated here. That was, of course, at a time when Europe was still divided, when Ronald Reagan was president, when Americans wondered about Genscherism, and when uh, the division of the world in different blocks seemed to be uh, eternal. Much has changed since, and um, I will try not to bore you this evening, but I will share with you some deeper information about the policy which we are pursuing with an emphasis on the economic side of it, because many of the emotions have been created over the economic offer and about the uh, specific tools on how to ensure economic integration on our continent. The timing is uh, appropriate, and you said this, uh, Ambassador Shimoni, that we uh, are in a time where we are post Eastern Partnership Vilnius Summit in November, which was a quite dramatic uh, event. And we are just a few days before the EU-Russia summit. President Putin will be in Brussels on the 28th of January. A lot has been written about and seen on screens about this dramatic summit, and since then about Euromaidan demonstrations in Kiev. EU foreign policy in its eastern neighborhood has suddenly become very visible with hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians demonstrating for a change of the way their country is governed. Questions are being asked about the role of Russia in uh, contributing to the U-turn of the leadership away from well-established policies. Taking a U-turn away from a policy which has been pursued between the EU and Ukraine over not less than eight years with different administrations responding to the European aspirations of the population. Much has been written about this, with many characterizing this as a geopolitical rivalry between the EU and Russia over spheres of influence using uh, economic integration means. I'm happy to discuss with you the political and security uh, concerns in more detail in the questions and answers part, but I would like to explain to you in more detail about what this policy is all about, that people get so um, agitated about it. I see the ambassador of Latvia joining us. Welcome, sir. Um, we uh, have with our policies vis-a-vis -vis our neighbors in Eastern Europe, including Russia, I would like to say, the aim to create conditions to unlock the creative potential for growth, the creative potential for enterprise, the creative potential for citizens at large in a Europe of stability, security, prosperity, and openness. In fact, it was President Prodi who in uh, 2003 wanted us to create what he called an arc of stability around the European Union. We don't have the luxury of the United States having two big oceans uh, and then a difficult border with Mexico and a rather open border with Canada. Uh, we have many neighbors and we have many areas of instability and we have strong demographic pressures from many sides of people who would like to go into the European Union. He said everything but institutions for our closest neighbors, whether they are in the south of Europe or in the east of Europe. That was the birth of the European neighborhood policy. And um, that was 2003. Uh, we have offered at that time not only our eastern <coughs> and southern neighbors this policy, but also to Russia. Russia said, thank you very much. That is an external projection of EU's interests and instruments. For, that's for small countries. 
we are a strategic partner of the EU, we want to have our own strategic partnership. The Eastern Partnership was born in 2009, originally an in initiative of Poland and Sweden. It is the Eastern dimension of the neighborhood policy. And uh, the uh, main strands of that policy are political association in foreign security policy and home and justice, our economic integration, mainly through deep and comprehensive free trade, our mobility, visa liberalization, and significantly enhanced funding. Both the Eastern Partnership and our policy towards Russia provide new opportunities for engagement with citizens and business. I would like to show to you that these uh, policies are complementary and not contradictory and they are perhaps being pursued with different speeds and different tempos, but they should not be seen as contradictory. The Eastern Partnership is a joint policy of the EU and its Eastern European partners, Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, Armenia, Georgia and Azerbaijan, aimed at bringing our Eastern neighbors closer to the uh, EU. The, uh, Political association economic integration does not provide a perspective of membership of the EU, but does leave this question open. The more the countries manage to create Europe inside their countries, the better their possibilities may be for them to convince the current EU members that such membership question is not out of question. In essence, the policy is about moving those societies and economies from opportunities for a few, a few strong ones, a few happy ones, a few privileged ones, to new opportunities for many. It is to allow people to move and meet. That is why mobility of citizens is an important part of this policy. It is about creating networks between the EU and its partners across all sectors of the economy and society, whether in energy, transport, environment, education, research, or innovation. This partnership is based on values. Our commitments to the principles of international law and to fundamental values, including democracy, the rule of law, and the respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. The EU is committed to supporting reform not only through the association with greater economic integration, but also increased funding. The annual funding increased from 2007 of 400 million for these countries to 825 million in 2013. Total funding over the last six years, 3.8 billion euros. I talk here about grant money. There is, of course, also a lot of loans happening, not only from the EBRD in London, but also from the European Investment Bank. The allocations are based on the principle of more for more. More funding and a stronger policy-based partnership for those partners who make more progress towards <coughs> reform, real reforms. So we differentiate between our partners depending on how close they wish to get to the EU, depending on their courage with their reform agenda. But we do not discriminate. It is an inclusive partnership. To achieve the ambitious goals of the Eastern Partnership, two parallel paths are followed. The bilateral one, strengthening long-standing relations with each of the countries, and the multilateral one, address challenges which are common to all partners. The summit in Vilnius highlighted both the achievements and also the challenges. Uh, we will look carefully at the reasons why not all the aims were reached at that summit. What we did reach is that we took a step forward in the deepening of bilateral relations with our partners in Moldova and Georgia by initialing the association agreements. It was, of course, also foreseen <coughs> to sign the agreement with Ukraine, and we were confronted with a last-minute decision of the President of Ukraine, contradicting the decision of his own government, which was taken as recently as on the 18th of September 
to postpone signature. This was the result of significant Russian pressure and a dire financial situation of the country close to bankruptcy. The EU remains ready to proceed with signature as soon as Ukraine is ready. The association agreement remains on the table. Now, what has caused this turnaround? There are many interpretations, and uh, I will go into some of the um, economic reasoning which has been put forward to us from two sources, one Ukrainian and second Russian sources. But before doing so, we will, uh, I will have to further uh, explain to you what this association agreement consists of. In terms of economic integration, it has a very far-reaching trade investment chapter called the Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Area, DCFTA. These are blueprints for reforms helping to overcome long-standing stalemates over necessary political or economic reforms. It takes uh, a lot of political will to uh, apply these commitments. Uh, it is including in the field of trade investment a broad range of EU standards and regulations which should be implemented by specific deadlines in exchange for increased market access. To be effective and unlock the full potential, there will be the need to build up effective public administration implementation capacity, to have a determined fight against corruption, and to work on an independent judiciary. I said before that um, it is about opportunities for citizens. I will give you two examples for this. First, in, with regard to improved mobility, Moldova, Ukraine and Georgia are making progress towards visa liberalization through the implementation of so-called visa liberalization action plans. And in fact, Moldova is uh, likely to become in the next very few months the first country of the Eastern Partnership to benefit from that visa liberalization, allowing its citizens to travel without a visa to the EU for short-term stays. With Armenia and Azerbaijan, improved mobility for citizens has been achieved through visa facilitation and readmission agreements, which were signed last year with a reduction of visa fee for all citizens. And we will shortly begin negotiations of such an agreement with Belarus, which has three years said we don't want to negotiate this as long as you keep our president on a visa ban list. Now they have made a turn, a change of policy on this. The second example are opportunities for business. DCFTAs guarantee duty-free access to the EU, the world's largest internal market with 500 million citizens, and a GDP of 12.9 trillion euros. By comparison, the customs union market is 1.4 trillion euros. The EU's market represents one-fifth of the world GDP, and a recent World Bank study as well as a similar study by the EBRD, refers to the largely positive effects arising from both multilateral trade integration into the WTO plus free trade areas with the EU as main drivers of economic growth for these countries. DCFTAs will open broad possibilities for the business communities with a vast majority of customs duties on goods to be removed soon after the agreement enters into force with services and establishment, uh, the uh, uh, partners would provide each other with market access for cross-border services in a wide range of areas. Studies about the long-term growth effect on Ukraine's GDP, to take one country's example, vary from conservative estimates of 4.3% from Oxford Economics to 6.2% from the German Advisory Group. There are questions which are raised whether uh, traditional sectors of production would be able to face to this competition. The EU's answer is yes, despite all recent statements to the contrary by some. Why? Because the liberalization, and I take here again the case of Ukraine, will be asymmetrical. That means the EU provides for more market access earlier 
than Ukraine provides its market access. Second, because particularly sensitive sectors have longer adaptation periods, up to 10 years for Ukraine, in the case of automobiles, 15 years, to adapt to a more competitive environment. In fact, this was explicitly acknowledged by the Ukrainian Prime Minister Azarov on 18 September, before their mind had been changed by somebody else, when the decision of his government to proceed with, to, with signature was taken. DCFTAs are comprehensive in that, that they include, compared to simple FTAs, a number of disciplines which go beyond trade only rules. They are deep because they incorporate specific policy reform dimensions on the basis of many EU laws, norms, and standards. This encourages increased trade and investments, not only from the EU, but from many other countries. And you cannot imagine how many countries, from China to Brazil, from Korea to India, from Turkey to Canada, have uh, queried with us in the dramatic weeks before the Vilnius summit Will you succeed with them or not? For us, it's a key step to take, even though we are not part of this agreement, but it will create the stable and predictable, predictable environment which we need in order to enter into the country and to invest there. Reform of economic regulations, upgrading of quality standards will not only have benefits in terms of increased trade, but bring other positive changes for society at large. For example, higher sanitary standards in food production will contribute to better food safety. Better protection of intellectual property rights can induce innovation. Improved competition policy will prevent abuse of market power. Competitive pressure stemming from liberalization of market access will encourage specialization, thereby lowering costs and generating innovation. So, in sum, the reforms which are intended with all this are supposed to result in the modernization of the economies, but also in the modernization of the political fabric of the countries, because often there has been prolonged stalemate over any such reform steps, which have all too often become the prey of specific oligarchic interests. But it means, of course, also that there is a break with the past in terms of behavior of elite structures. And it requires strong political leadership and commitment at highest level. The Eastern Partnership is not designed to be exclusive to the detriment of others. In particular, Russia, as an important partner for the Eastern European countries, and Russian trade according to our view of things, also stand to benefit from the Eastern Partnership. From the outset, we have been very transparent with Russia about the goals and instruments of the Eastern Partnership. And it is regrettable that Russia seems to have concluded that association agreements and DCFDAs with Eastern European countries would negatively affect Russian interests. There is almost an obsession with this. And for those of you who follow Eastern policies, look, almost every day there are new emanations of this from presidential advisor Glaziev. I particularly uh, recommend for anyone who is a student of Eastern politics to read the piece of the 27th of December in gazeta.ru. The Oxford Economic Study concluded that the DCFDA would not affect Russia's economic interests in any way as risks for its business are minimal while potential benefits are big, Russian companies producing in Ukraine can take advantage of the EU free market access. Instead, there are Russian fears stoked which have gone up to the level of the president and prime minister in Ukraine, talking about the Russian market being flooded with substandard Ukrainian products, talking about the uh, a diversion of trade by European products arriving in Ukraine, talking about the need to stop industrial cooperation, particularly in the defense sector between Russian companies and Ukrainian companies. Nothing of all this is written in our agreement, but just to make the point, Russia has taken many trade-stopping uh, measures 
uh, in August and since August, uh, so that many companies in Ukraine were directly affected and the trade with Ukraine went down. It also announced that if they would sign the agreement, Russia would have to renounce to its free trade agreement under the CAS with Ukraine because there would be a sudden surge of imports in a neighboring country. Uh, and so preventively, they would have to withdraw the preferential privileges, which would have meant overnight an increase by 10% of the customs duties. So this is uh, what we uh, call clearly external pressures on countries, economic and security pressures, in order to influence the decisions of countries on the European continent, the EU has clearly denounced as unacceptable. We do not share such zero-sum thinking. We do not believe in rivaling spheres of interest. We do not believe in the interest of coercion in a continent which should be governed by the principles of the Helsinki Final Act of the OCE, which includes, of course, the right of every country to freely determine its own systems as well as its foreign and economic associations. The EU will always respect the historic, cultural, economic and political links which exist between its neighbors, but we firmly believe that Russia should, together with Kazakhstan, Belarus, see this as opportunities and not try to uh, create situations where countries in the common neighborhood do believe that they have no other choice than being able to join uh, the customs union, or at least not to enter into association with the EU. The principle of free choice is a clear red line for the EU, and this will also be made clear at the EU-Russia summit. The EU invites Russia to engage in the construction of an inclusive, mutually beneficial cooperation process. Uh, we have with Russia a situation of mutual economic interdependence. 80% uh, of foreign direct investment in Russia comes from the European Union. 50% of foreign trade of Russia is with the European Union. About 60% of fiscal income of the Russian Federation stems from export duties on hydrocarbon exports from Russia to the European Union and of course 40% of our energy imports come from Russia. In, when one has such a strong economic relationship and Russia is our third largest economic partner after the US and China, then uh, one should not engage in such a confrontational uh, positioning, uh, which of course reflects uh, the top foreign policy priority of the Russian leadership, which is the creation of the Eurasian Union. The EU remains committed to the joint vision of a common economic space from the Atlantic to the Pacific, based on WTO rules, converging norms and standards, and the sovereign free decision-making of all countries concerned. On the basis of these principles, close cooperation between the EU and the future Eurasian Union is a realistic <coughs> perspective. We are uh, striving towards that aim with our strategic partnership with Russia. We are having very good work, including on regulatory issues and on rule of law issues in the EU-Russia partnership for modernization. And we hope to uh, restart very soon our negotiations on a new agreement with Russia, uh, setting out a new framework. Let me conclude uh, the intervention by stressing that the EU aims at forging deeper relations with both our Eastern European partner countries, probably quicker, probably deeper, uh, as well as with Russia, our strategic partner with whom we work well together on many issues of global and regional interest uh, to both. We do have uh, a degree of tension on our continent, which we haven't seen in many years, and we need to make every effort to reduce those temperatures again. We should become more pragmatic, more sober. We do believe that there is a win-win situation achievable for all the EU, Eastern European partners and Russia, based on a strong emphasis on values and
principles which I have laid out at the beginning. Uh, it is um, a difficult situation currently, uh, but we should um, uh, avoid that we are developing new ideological dividing lines on the European continent. Thank you for your attention and sorry if this was very economic and very technical and I'm happy to go into more politics if you wish. Thank you very much, Gunnar. My name is Mike Haltzel, as uh, Andras said. I'm senior fellow here. Um, <coughs> first thing I'm going to do <laughs> is to repay the favor. Andras has the first question, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Go ahead, Andras. Well, thank you very much. This is, this is excellent. I'm an economist. I also hear economics, so that's good. But, but let me, let me uh, Do we have a mic? So oh, is there a mic? You can pick this up, yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, this is excellent. So I'll repeat, I'm an economist, so I love to hear about economics. But let me, uh, obviously, I, my first concern is Russia, and I, I'd like to make, make a few comments and then ask, ask a question. Uh, one is that clearly Russia has, is sliding back. Uh, the democratic, I mean, it's never been a, a democracy the way I I perceive a democracy, but it's been a lot better than it is now. The problem is that it's the, the Russian uh, uh, Vladimir Putin's system is becoming a model. And there are others who are looking at Vladimir Putin as a model. Now, it's clear to me that, and, and, and I, I, I'd like you to be a little, little bit precise on this. Uh, with the West, and Putin knows, the West is not a threat to Russia. The West is a threat to his eternal power. And I think that is really the driving force. My problem is that I do see that Russia does have a strategy how to push back on democracy and human rights and how to push back in the advancement of democracy. And I do believe that what's happening in Ukraine is not so much strategic, not so much, not just, not just economic, but very much related to not wanting the European norms, transparency, rule of law to encroach Russia. So I, what I want to come to is I'd like you to talk to me a little bit more about how, 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 how is Europe handling the abuse of human rights in Russia? What are we, you know, what are our expectations in terms of uh, the, the one issue that is very, very dear to, to me is the specific aspect to, of, of human rights which is, uh, which is the disastrous situ situation of LGBT rights in, in that country. Uh, what are we doing? What is, what is, what is Europe, Europe doing in, in this respect? So I'd like to, I was very pleased to hear that the European Union will raise these issues at the next, uh, next summit, uh, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about it. Uh, honestly, I am worried. Thank you, Andras. Would you like to uh, answer this question directly, or would you prefer to I'm in your hands. What get? You? Well, I think this this is a fundamental question. Why don't you go to that? Then we'll 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 get to others. Um, first, uh, I think I share your analysis that uh, there are uh, fears. There are two top priorities. One is uh, the creation of the Eurasian Union, and the other one is domestic stability. And domestic stability, we have seen what it means uh, when confronted with uh, massive outpouring of uh, discontent in Russian cities uh, of the uh, new middle class. Um, and, uh, and the leadership was shaken by, uh, by the mass demonstrations and has uh, done a number of steps since then, and notably the foreign agents law, for example. We have the uh, Bodotnaya case. We have had a number of ways of dealing with uh, so-called elements dan in putting in danger the internal stability of uh, Russia. Uh, but it has not gone into massive outright repression either, because for this, Russia has developed far too far. You can't put the ghost bat back into the bottle. <coughs> um, several Ukrainian decision makers have said to us, including of those of the current governing uh, party, that 
they have realized that if they succeed with us and if there is real democracy with uh, uh, real rule of law in Ukraine, exactly. that this has a very strong uh, impact in terms of signal to Russia. In other words, it is possible to do this also in a big Slavic country with a different tradition than in the, in the west of Europe or in the US. And the Eurasian Union has a whole um, uh, underpinning of um, so-called Eurasian values, uh, which are uh, sometimes messianic, uh, so-called traditional values. And uh, that's also one of the reasons why I recommend to you reading the December 27 piece which ends with a description of these <coughs> Eurasian values. It has become some form of a new uh, state ideology almost. <coughs> and I would like to recall that uh, the Russian Federation is uh, a member state of not only the United Nations, but also of the Council of Europe, where we have binding um, commitments and binding conventions on uh, rule of law issues. We have uh, jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights, with many cases from Russia. And Russia is eager, and there are people uh, in, in the government also to, uh, to live up to that. So it's not a black and white picture. Uh, we are working with Russia on many of the issues. For example, we have worked with them on the creation of an appeal system, which didn't exist before in civil and criminal justice, uh, the prison situation. Uh, we are having very regular human rights uh, dialogues uh, in detail with uh, twice a year with the uh, Russian side. Uh, the Un United States has uh, abandoned the human rights uh, dialogue. And of course, um, many of the issues which are being raised are not necessarily being followed up. On LGBT, um, this is an issue. There is uh, an, uh, legislation in place which we have denounced uh, with the general uh, attitude that uh, homosexuality is, is similar to pedophilia and needs to be uh, prosecuted and uh, we have uh, denounced that very clearly. Uh, it is, in the end with this, interesting to see how the uh, Russian Orthodox Church is behaving, uh, not only in Russia but Orthodox Churches in many other countries, uh, trying to instrumentalize uh, the European Union's um, attempt to ensure, and we do this in the Eastern Partnership, that anti-discrimination legislation be enacted. Um, and the EU's anti-discrimination legislation is limited to the um, uh, cases of um, uh, discrimination against minorities and all forms of minorities at the working place. And um, this is what we require from countries who wish to move towards visa freedom with us. And that is used by the Orthodox Church to mobilize public opinion against the European Union, saying, here comes the decadent Europeans who want to impose same-sex marriage on our population. And of course, it has nothing to do with that. Our member states uh, are having very different approaches to that very question. And this issue of LGBT, unfortunately, has been instrumentalized in big ways by foes of those who um, uh, would like to see the so-called influence of the West to be reduced. And for us, it's not a question about influence of the West. For us, it's about respect of uh, basic uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms. Let me very quickly just follow up this, because you've, you, you indicate that you're going to hold to your ideals uh, with regard to Eastern Partnership Association with Ukraine. If they don't buy into the, into the common values that you uh, outlined. It'll sit on the table as an offer, and it can sit there for a long time. The whole question of whether the EU is going to water down its, 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 its principles in order to get stability in other places, I realize we're, we're not talking about the Balkans here, but this, you know, Sadich Finci in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which was a decision by the European Court of Human Rights is a perfect example of this, and, and we're still waiting to see. The indications are that there, because of a fear of instability, the EU is going to be willing to, uh, to water down its standards. Um, you know, stability is a fine thing, but uh, if it means that Ukraine morphs into a sovereign democracy like Russia, 
then maybe it's not such a fine thing. I mean, what I'm trying to say is it's great to hold on to your values, but I think you've, you've said yourself that uh, while it should be a win-win situation for Russia and the EU if Ukraine would, would uh, sign an association agreement, it's certainly not a win-win situation for Putin and his Siloviki, and they're in charge. And I mean, I just think there's a, you know, I mean, a fundamental uh, conflict there that's not going to go away. I, and I applaud the bilateral working groups. We have a lot of bilateral working groups with the Russians, too. They help to some extent, but it's, it's you know, it's nibbling at the edges, I'm afraid. There's one more comment on the question. Right? Yeah. Uh, you see, the uh, EU uh, will not lose its uh, credibility vis-a-vis -vis our own member states. Um, we would not be able to have such an ambitious policy protection in our neighborhood without being clear about on which basis we are engaging. Uh, nor will we lose our credibility vis-a-vis -vis all those who believe in such values and who believe in rule of law and who believe in checks and balances. If it is just a question of um, stabilizing the neighborhood by uh, doing... Um, deals on shaky grounds, um, we would uh, lose that credibility. Um, that doesn't mean that we would not be able to conduct in pragmatic ways relations with people who don't share our approach, but if people want to be associated with the EU, if people want to go into uh, significant um, uh, market openings with us, then also the um, political side and the um, approach to rule of law must be right. Well, I, I'm glad to hear that, and I encourage you to hold fast. And now we're going to go to the audience. Not everybody knows everybody else, so I'm going to have to ask you to identify yourself. I see Georgian Ambassador first. No, he, right here, front row first. Go ahead. Shall I? Please do. Thank you, sir. Ambassador of Georgia. Uh, you mentioned that uh, association agreement, they uh, do not uh, mean opening up European perspective, That, but at the same time, they leave the question open. Uh, my first question would be, uh, uh, how much of the European acquis should, should be, what should be the critical mass of the European acquis transposed to the uh, aspirant country so that uh, this European perspective uh, can be opened? And in this regard, if successful, implementation of the association agreements, how much of the transposition of the acquis would allow in Georgia's, Moldova's, and hopefully Ukraine's case? The, the second question is... Well, uh, well, why don't we limit it to one, Mr. Okay. Ambassador? We have about f six or seven people All right. in the back. Go ahead. This is not exact science. It's political science. So uh, <laughs> the... Uh, uh, you have made your own choice as Georgia, and uh, we were pleased to be able to negotiate with uh, negotiators of two administrations. Uh, the deal was finalized by the new government. Uh, you have made your choice how far you want to go in transposing EU legislation in areas of sector policy. You were not really free in your choice when it comes to trade investment, because there we require our partners to take over uh, a very significant part. Uh, and why do we do this? Because that makes uh, the market access of people who want to invest in Georgia much more easy, because then you can really enter without any hindrance uh, any part of, the, of our internal market. Uh, but the membership question is a question which uh, is uh, not dependent on how much of the uh, um, a key you would you would take over. We have countries who have taken uh, the entire a key, like um, Norway, because they are in the European economic um, area, and they take automatically over the entire a key, not only the trade investment a key. Um, of course, if they wanted, they could become quickly member because, but they just don't want. Um, uh, we have others like Switzerland. A pick and choose approach. 
but still de facto a very important part. So what I want to say with this is it is very important that a reality is created uh, inside the country in terms of the actual uh, functioning of, of the state um, and uh, the um, uh, successful implementation of the commitments you have now entered into. And um, the uh, question is open. Uh, there are different formulations used to express this in the different agreements. And um, I would say that uh, our treaty says what it says about European states, um, and it is the wisdom of the leadership of the countries to ask certain questions when the time is ripe. More I don't want to say about the subject. I saw Steve Wuerl's hand next. Uh, Mike, please, right here. Yeah, Put your hand up if you would so you can see. Yeah. Hi, uh, Steve Wuerl, Congressional Research Service. I want to ask uh, exactly how the DCFTA will interact with the Transnistria problem. Assuming they sign, I guess the same problem exists for Georgia. Can everybody hear what Steve is saying? Yes. Good. Yeah. Uh, how will the how will the DC FTA interact with the Transnistria situation? Because obviously they're not accepting, they're not going to accept the key or that they're not going to do anything with that. Uh, uh, do, will they nevertheless still get the benefits of DC FTA for a transitional period or not at all, or or will Moldova <coughs> have to do some sort of informal border in there in some point in the future? How, how exactly? Does that work? And I guess the same problem obtains uh, with Georgia as well. Thank you. Uh, no borderization because of us. Um, the visa liberalization for Moldovans or for Georgians will be visa liberalization for all holders of Moldovan or Georgian passports with biometric identifiers wherever they live in Moldova or Georgia. Same principle for the application of DCFDA. We have special provisions which would allow us to apply the DCFDA provisions to the entities currently not under control of the central authority by common decision between Moldova and uh, the European Union or between Georgia and uh, the European Union. But our trade negotiators are tough people. They say we can't have free riders. There are people who would then uh, not do anything of what is necessary uh, in terms of uh, fulfilling the requirements, in terms of standards, uh, checks, and so on. So uh, these uh, requirements will have to be fulfilled. You would be pleased to know that uh, main industry of Moldova happens to be in Transnistria. And that Transnistrian companies, these Transnistrian companies, uh, there are a number of big companies who produce 50, 60 percent of their production for the EU market. So there is a strong interest of those operators. And we, um, we are in, in talks uh, with Moldovan and Transistian uh, officials to create a situation where this could be extended, therefore, uh, to Transistia by the end, before the end of 2015 when our autonomous trade preferences will end. The situation with Georgia is more complicated because um, there is very little economic substance uh, which would be really benefiting from uh, trade. There is no real exports going on currently. And of course, the situation also in view of the Russian presence is not uh, really comparable. I do, however, not exclude that there may be certain maneuvers to prevent the extension of our free trade uh, area uh, to Transnistria by other uh, by other players, and recently there has been apparently a law adopted in Duma, which would allow the automatic application of Russian law to Transnistria. I saw your hand before, sir. Yes, we have. Put your hand up, please, and you'll get a mic. Yes, right there. Hi, Alex. All right, Racing. and then next to Mr. Yeah, go ahead. You can yep. speak. Okay, uh, Alex Racy, American University alumnus. Um, so in light of the new German governing coalition supporting uh, trilateral negotiations between Russia, the Ukraine, and the European Union, do you see that as having a potentially negative impact on public opinion of the European Union in Eastern Partnership countries and also on the association agreements and DCFTA negotiations? Uh, the new German government, as you say, uh, is uh, to an important degree, uh, the same as the past, in particular the Chancellor is the same. 
And uh, what the German government has said was not trilateral negotiations. They were in favor of trilateral talks. Um, the European Union's position, and I do represent the European Union and not the German government, is that A, no renegotiation of the agreement with Ukraine. B, we do not enter into talks with um, third countries about agreements which we have negotiated with second countries. This would set a rather unfortunate precedent that whenever an agreement would be negotiated or has just been finalized, it would be revised by a superior power uh, on behalf, perhaps even, of that country with whom we have concluded that. Um, that uh, seems to sink in now into many people's mind. Um, just imagine, uh, we have recently concluded a major agreement with Canada, which is deeper than the NAFTA agreement. And we haven't heard from the US that they would like to sit down with Canada and ask to verify what we have done there with Canada, and that this would be seen as an unfriendly act. So we should not introduce this, neither in, international, in, neither in foreign economic relations nor in, in, in political context. That, however, does not exclude that we would sit down with Russians and talk about the uh, concrete economic imp the perceived concrete and the real uh, impact uh, of such an agreement uh, on their industries and trade. We have uh, already done this uh, twice and uh, will continue, are ready to continue such talks. Uh, we certainly want to uh, contribute to uh, avoid um, the creation of myths in this respect. And I invite you, for those who are interested in the subject, to visit the website of the European Union's delegation in Kiev, where we have put together today on the website a whole list of myths which have been put out over the last few weeks about the impact of the DCFTA um, and uh, the answer answers which uh, need to be given to that. Could I just ask, if the talks are only for clarification purposes and not negotiations, why can't they just be bilateral? Why don't you just talk to the Russians and explain what deal you're giving to other countries without involving the... Absolutely. That's no problem. We can do that. Okay. <coughs> yes, sir. My, my name's Thomas Grindley. How, do, <coughs> how does NATO fit into the scheme of things. Do the European countries, which are members of NATO but not members of the EU, have any influence over or interest in the matters being negotiated? There are, there are still a few countries of um, Europe who are not members of the EU, that's true, and several of them are members of NATO. Tomorrow, mo not tomorrow, no, next week I will meet, for example, with the Norwegians. Yes, there is a lot of close interest. Also of non-EU, non-NATO members, for example, the Swiss Confederation. Uh, they are following this very closely because they are all directly impacted by this as well because they are in many ways very closely linked to the EU. So what we are doing with our eastern neighbors has an impact also on the other European countries. Yes, sir. Front row here, please. A lot of questions coming. Uh, thank you, Michael Sveda from the uh, Czech Embassy. Mm. Um, uh, Mr. Wigand, you, uh, you told that, uh, rightly so, that there are uh, certain things unacceptable, how the Russia behaves like external pressures, that there are certain red lines. Um, but uh, still, when Russia crosses these red lines, we uh, still, as a European Union, stretches, uh, stretch our hands and try to negotiate uh, again and again with Russia even if we know that uh, Russians are well aware of our deadline, uh, red lines and they do not respect them. 
uh, if you look at the map, then you see big Russia and small Europe, but economic-wise, it's uh, the other way around. Uh, EU is a big giant when com compared to Russia, and it has uh, powerful economic instruments to use uh, uh, when uh, uh, we deal with Russia. Don't you think uh, the time is ripe for European Union stops to be nice and uh, uses its economical power to uh, um, to show to Russians that there are red lines, and when these red lines are crossed, it it will hurt them. Thanks. Yeah, Russia is a very big country. Uh, you're right. Um, at the same time, its economy has the size of of a big EU member state uh, called Italy, and uh, sometimes Russia overlooks it is a big country and a big economy, but it is not as big as they think. And it is in particular not as diversified as they think. And it requires to make major efforts to acquire higher international competitiveness and to diversify its economic structures. And they know that Europe is its natural, necessary partner in doing that. We have, of course, strong interests of industry in Europe also, in the Russian market, and this applies to all our member states, who are quite well established in many ways. And we have to keep this in mind as well, so we are not interested in a degradation of our overall relationship and in endangering of the uh, commercial relationship. But uh, I um, fully understand your question. We have recently gone to the first WTO case with Russia over car recycling fees, which is a blatant violation of their WTO commitments, and I do not exclude that there may be further cases coming. The wider political question you ask is when there are measures taken against Eastern Partnership partners, or we even had recently the case, cases against um, Lithuania when it was the EU presidency, whether the EU should not act not only in terms of certain support measures, like it did vis-a-vis -vis Moldova with Moldovan wine, but also in terms of countermeasures vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Um, this, I would say, at this stage is uh, an open possibility, but which, has not, um, at, um, which is not actively contemplated at this stage, but is not excluded. I'm now going to use the typical moderator's tactic. It is late. I don't know how much more time you have, Gunnar, but uh, I thought we'd gather two or three questions together, and then we'll let our, our speaker decide if and how he wants to answer them. So you have that back there, and then Ted here, and then the young lady, and then the gentleman there. So we will have four. But be very concise if you would ask a question. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. I'm a student at American University. My name is Mihail, and I wanted to thank you for uh, speaking this evening. Uh, my question to you is sort of hypothetical. I know you mentioned that um, if Ukraine were to sign that deal with the EU, Russia would renounce their support and recognition as a member in CIS. So how do you see Ukraine proceeding in the next few months? Do you see them signing that deal uh, and possibly facing those consequences uh, related to CIS? Um, or do you, see the, do you see a conflict arising between Russia and Ukraine in the next few months? Okay. Next question. I think there's somebody right there. Why don't you just work your way toward the front? Go ahead. There's a second mic. Yeah. Okay. My name is Stephen Hudson. I have another economic question for you. I was curious. You're from Mr. Hudson? I'm sorry? You're from where? Um, I'm with the U.S. Uh, Travel Association, but I'm here on my own behalf. Thanks. Um, I have another economic uh, question, which is, uh, to what degree do you think that uh, the current economic situation worldwide and in Europe is a factor in um, countries like Ukraine looking back uh, to the east, to Russia? Uh, for instance, um, I know the Economist Intelligence Unit has uh, proposed in their democracy index that you've seen a worldwide aggregate, uh, aggregate democratic decline. Likewise, um, one of the major motivations during the last expansion um, for the European Union was the economic benefits, which you don't, don't see as much today with uh, high unemployment and that sort of issue. Okay. Right here in the second row, you had your hand up. Yes? Right. 
Hi, I'm uh, Mike Wehara with the State Department Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Um, we tried very hard to try to send an appointment with you, uh, but our Deputy Assistant Secretary was called to testify at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearing on Ukraine, which sort of wiped out the whole day yesterday. Um, I just met him on the floor. We shook hands and we had okay. a few words. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and also, please uh, pass on my regards to Dirk Shuba. Um, the, in Ukraine, I think that uh, President Yanukovych, uh, uh, now that he has uh, put uh, Prime Minister, uh, former Prime Minister Timoshenko in prison, realizes that uh, the stakes for not staying in power have been uh, raised dramatically. And uh, so uh, one can expect that he will do everything within his power to uh, come out on top with regard to the 2015 election. And so I was just wondering what the European Union uh, is doing to ensure that that is, in fact, an open and fair competition. Thanks. Okay. I thought we had one more hand back there. Well, we have two more. Okay. Real uh, yes, it is. concise. Yes, Go ahead. Uh, Peter Souch and I also work for the State Department. Related question. Uh, how long will the EU keep its door open for Ukraine, considering recent developments of this legislation, rather onerous legislation passed yesterday, reportedly already signed into law? Further repression. What is the EU's red line on Ukraine, and is how long will you keep the door open? Okay. I think we're going to have to call a halt there and let Mr. Vigon decide what, how, and whether he's going to answer all the questions. Thank you. Well, that's uh, mostly on. Uh, in fact, it's all on Ukraine. Um, but I start perhaps with the most general question. Um, the uh, impact of economic crisis, you are from the Travel uh, Association saying Europe is becoming less attractive. That was probably your main message. I, at least for argument's sake. Yes, yes, no, I appreciate <laughs> that. That is, of course, <laughs> the argumentation of some people who say this decaying Europe, no growth, no babies. Um, in terms of tourism, at least, we are booming. And right. I can reassure you, Europe is back <laughs> on the path towards growth. Uh, and uh, it is with real growth in a number of member states. Um, the one I know best doesn't have any such problem in any case. The Russian Federation, in turn, is uh, ca um, uh, dealing with uh, decelerating growth rates, uh, provision for this year 1.3%, which is a big problem because it is at a time of very high uh, oil prices uh, for Russia. It's not a good sign. So I can assure you uh, we have had so many talks in so much detail with the Ukrainian leadership. Uh, it was not that they said because of the uh, financial crisis which had swept over from America to Europe and has lasted longer in Europe than in America and has still an impact in several of our countries because it was combined with a state debt crisis. Uh, they were not interested in Europe anymore. Uh, in fact, it seems as if you have not seen this outpouring of massive enthusiasm of Ukrainians of all ages waving European Union flags, nobody in Europe does this, um, <laughs> waving in, in, in the European Union does this, and ask the Europa United Kingdom, um, waving European Union flags because it is a symbol for a different system of governance. It is a symbol for a society of opportunities. It is a sim symbol for freedom, and it is a symbol for people who uh, can count that things work <coughs> and uh, that attraction has, in other words, not ended at all. And that keeps us also going, because we know that the same thing applies to Georgians or to Moldovans. We know that the aspiration of people is to live in a system which, which works, which provides results, and where you're not the result, wh where you're not um, an, an, an object, but where you are a subject. The association agreement would be signed, would this create a crisis with Russia, and would Ukraine have to renounce to its CIS membership? 
Ukraine has assumed the presidency of the CIS, so I think that they will not leave the CIS uh, this year. Uh, the CIS is the least uh, closely knit union of the East until a few years ago. Even Georgia under Saakashvili was part of the CIS until President Saakashvili decided enough is enough. But it was never a very binding uh, club. So I think one can sign a cessation agreement and be a member of the CIS. I don't see any uh, mutual exclusivity in this. What one cannot do is to sign a cessation agreement and be a member of the customs union. Yeah, exactly. Because when you are a member of the customs union, you join a protectionist club, you increase your tariffs, and you lose your trade policy autonomy. Um, the uh, question of uh, uh, 2015 is a very relevant question. Uh, our door is open to Ukraine as a country uh, and in terms of association. If this doesn't work out with this government under the current circumstances, it will work out when the Ukrainian people have rulers who know where the long-term development opportunities will exist, which I insist are not to the detriment of existing links with Russia. This occasion may come in 2015 and uh, maybe before, maybe later, but we, I agree fully with you, every effort has to be made by the international community and that includes of course uh, the OECE as well okay. to make sure that this will be elections which are indeed free and fair and not manipulated with all kind of candidates who have been excluded, with media who are controlled, and with repressive um, actions by law enforcement um, authorities. Uh, the colleague from the uh, State Department uh, referred to uh, the situation in Ukraine today. It is an exceptionally negative day today because a whole host of laws have been voted through, I think not less than four or five, which have all uh, repressive uh, character from stripping much more easily members of parliament of their mandate uh, to uh, foreign agents law with regard to um, uh, actions of NGOs. Um, many of these sound particularly familiar from other country contexts. So there seems to be a lot of technical assistance going on in drafting such legislation. We need indeed to be very clear, uh, we have issued already a statement in this respect, and I understand that the United States will do the same thing now. Um, we cannot um, say to Ukraine uh, at every time something bad happens uh, that uh, now we change uh, our policy fundamentally, but if there is a, a sustained trend of repression, if there is uh, violence, if there are um, acts which will lead the society to an authoritarian system, then I'm afraid indeed we will have to change our policy towards Ukraine because otherwise we would not be consistent with our principles, which brings us back to the beginning of the discussion. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Andras in just a second. I, I want to thank you. I think it's just been really terrific. You have, you combine encyclopedic knowledge with, I think, really even-handed judgment. Absolutely superb, but I'll give the final word to Andras. To uh, okay, Gunnar, thank you very much. This really has been a, a, a very good discussion, and I, I applaud you. It's uh, no wonder you're an alum of this institution. Uh, but I, I, let me just, uh, I, I wish we had more time, and one issue that I definitely would have wanted to discuss in depth is the energy uh, dependence of Europe uh, on, on the Russians and the way the Russians are using the, uh, the energy as, as their, their new super, uh, super uh, weapon. I, I just want to make one comment. I, I really like the comment by, by my Czech, young Czech uh, colleague. Uh, I, I very much agree with him. Uh, two things. One, uh, I think it's important, words are enough. I think there has to come a point when we draw a red line uh, that red line has to be meaningful, and I think the Russians have to have to understand that this re red line will have a, a, a crossing the red line will have consequences. And this, the the other thing, uh, if I may say it also on behalf of my my Czech colleague, um, 
is something that I frequently tell people uh, when they discard my criticism to the Russians, oh, you're just a Hungarian. Just because we're Czechs and Hungarians, we might still be right about Russia. Thank you. You join us in thanking Guru Vigan. Thank you, Thank you.